There's no shame in admitting that sometimes a joke goes over your head. Like when Mike said knock knock, and I said, but we have a doorbell. Really made a hash of that one. And it is definitely acceptable to admit you didn't get all the jokes in the games you played as a kid, because some in-game humour was and is so targeted at adults that it sails clear over the heads of younger players with its mystifying references and risque double entendre. So let's all of us sophisticated adults gathered here today enjoy these sophisticated adult jokes with our clever adult brains. Beware of rude things and saucy wordplay ahead. Don't get me wrong, Old School Shooter Rise of the Triad was definitely not a game for kids, which is exactly why I wanted to play it so much, obviously. That and everyone wore fun hats on national holidays. Rot, as it was known, was like Doom, but somehow even more violent, with a spectacular array of deadly weaponry and more blood and guts than the bins round the back of a butcher's shop. I think I just became vegetarian. The irony is that even though Rise of the Triad is a game that really only people old enough to vote should be allowed to play, it contains a joke that's probably the most childish on this list. It concerns the playable character called Ian Paul Freely. That could definitely be a human person's name. Surprise though, those first two initials are I and P. This means of course that whenever he looks at his credit card for instance, it will say I P Freely thus implying to the cashier that he is a man who does not adhere to traditional bathroom conventions when he urinates. Either that or he enjoys entirely unrestricted flow. I wouldn't like to speculate. It may just be because it took us an embarrassing amount of time to get this joke, but the whole scenario seems utterly ridiculous. What parent would curse a child with that name and consign them to years of playground bullying? Besides, how often does anyone use the phrase I pee freely? It's not something you tend to loudly announce. I pee freely. Honestly, it's like Bart prank calling Moe's Tavern in an episode of The Simpsons. Specifically, episode 3, season 1, Homer's Odyssey. Why can I remember that but not my pin number? <laughs> Unsophisticated among you might think that the humour in the Grand Theft Auto series is just a succession of crude puns, but that's because you don't appreciate satire like me and my fellow intellectuals. Hey! <laughs> that was satire! Whenever you make that face, I'm doing satire. The point is, GTA jokes are about as highbrow as a frowning caveman, so since we were playing the early GTA games at an age below the one on the age rating sticker, there were bound to be a few blue jokes that flew clean over our heads like an over-enthusiastically flung frisbee. One such gem was the name of the radio DJ on Head Radio, which was Michael Hunt. DJ Michael Hunt taking you through another set of non-stop rockets. He also, however, goes by a shorter name. I don't get it. You know, like how Michael shortens to Mike? So like Michael Hunt, but with Mike? Still not with you. This is all on you, Rockstar. With this in-game joke and actually several others, it wasn't until years later that we connected the mental dots and felt, well, a little bit embarrassed on Rockstar's behalf, if we're honest. Hey, it is Head Radio. I'm Michael Hunt. You can call me Mike. With another fat jam and non-stop rock from the station that can give you more because we pay our employees less. And who knows how many more word plays like that there are in there that just haven't clicked for us yet. Like, Liberty City, is that a thing? Claude Speed, sounds rude. Come back to me. Ah, the banana thief returns to the scene of the crime. Maybe we should just eat him right now. Do you have any idea how much cholesterol is in one of these things? The Secret of Monkey Island is a hilarious game with jokes that can be enjoyed by people of all ages. I mean, everyone can enjoy me telling this guy that he fights like a cow. Except him, I guess. You fight like a dairy farmer. How appropriate. You fight like a cow. I give up. You win. Devastating. He's devastated right now. 
That said, not every joke in Monkey Island was as easy for me to understand when I was a child. Later on in the game, you find yourself on the eponymous Monkey Island and need to collect a load of bananas to feed to a monkey so that the monkey will open a gate for you so you can stick a big cotton swab into a giant stone monkey head's ear and open a door to a lava cave full of pirate ghosts. Look, this is what adventure games were like in the 1990s. Just go with it. You can only get so many bananas from the island's trees, however, so to get sufficient bananas to bribe the monkey, you also have to steal some from the native islanders, who don't take kindly to you stealing their fruit. As Guybrush attempts to make off with several bananas hidden about his person, he is asked by the islanders if those are bananas in his pocket, or if he's just glad to see them. Is that a banana in your pocket, or are you just glad to see us? Now, I have to tell you, as a kid, I spent a while trying to decipher this line. Would Guybrush have been glad to see them because they might have more bananas? Or because those masks are really fun? Or because they're going to help him defeat ghost pirates? Not sure how the pocket banana factors into any of those, but maybe the high levels of potassium in those yellow fruits would give Guybrush the low blood pressure and reduced risk of stroke he needed to vanquish his arch nemesis, LeChuck. Who dares to enter the cabin of the ghost pirate LeChuck? Strange places, strange noises. Anyway, I later learned this line is a classic gag of a raunchy trouser-based nature, and to be honest, even with this information, I still don't entirely get it. Like, did he put the banana down the front of his trousers? Is that where the pocket is on pirate pants? Why are you making me think about this, Monkey Island? And don't even get me started on the bit in Monkey Island 2 where you find the belongings of a gorilla arrested for grinding his organ in public. This is supposed to be an ESRBE! Do these confusing letters mean nothing anymore? Okay, I'm ready. Energize! Space Quest 6 was a 90s adventure game that starred space janitor Roger Wilco and spoofed science fiction with a blatant disregard for the solemn dignity of the thinking person's genre. This guy looks like a vertically challenged Darth Vader. What does a thing like that do for fun? Ahem. It parodied classic sci-fi works such as Alien and Blade Runner, which we were too young to have seen at the time. Uh, buddy, maybe you can help me out. I'm trying to track down this Ender Droid. I'm an Ender Droid runner. I know they'll look so hot, but I'm in disguise, you know? As a result, when we met the comedy Xenomorph in a grimy space arcade, the reference was basically lost on us. So this is Stooge Fighter 3. Doesn't look so tough to me. Also, the arcade had a knockoff version of Street Fighter starring old timey comedy act The Three Stooges. Guess which part of that parody mashup we didn't recognise? At any rate, even though we hadn't seen terrifying space horror Alien, Space Quest VI looked enough like a Saturday morning cartoon that we were permitted to play it. Little did we or our parents know the game was packed with more adult humour than the erotic charades I once accidentally bought instead of the normal ones. That Christmas was ruined, let me tell you. If we had to pick one particularly bawdy visual gag from Space Quest VI, and we do, we'd say the inflatable alien love doll parked in the corner of this room was particularly confusing to underage players. This alien woman looks to be in very bad shape. Her pupils are fixed and dilated. Her body is stiff, almost as if she's dead. And her skin looks tight and puffy, as if bodily gases are building up inside her. The mannequin-looking thing owned by the thugs who kidnap you early in the game is looking back now, clearly an artificial companion. Bandages and patches appear in profusion all over her, and some of her seams look like they're about to give way. However, between the low-detail mid-90s graphics and unhelpfully sarcastic narrator, we were more or less mystified by this rubber roommate, which, also looking back now, was a reference to a lady character from Total Recall. Another film we had not seen at the time, thank goodness. You make a mental note to come back and rescue this poor woman. This was but one of the many ribald references in Space Quest VI that went over our naive heads. But hey, at least we could enjoy the myriad good clean jokes like the amusing shape of this spaceship. See? Definitely get that. Un underpants. Looks like a underpants.
For those unfamiliar with the series, the Ace Attorney games tell the story of plucky lawyers who win justice for their clients by presenting evidence, banging the desk, or just shouting objection as loudly as they can until the judge rules in their favour. Yeah, good point. Not guilty. In the third case of Phoenix Wright Justice for All, Turnabout Big Top, lawyer Phoenix finds himself doing the shouting on the behalf of stage magician and amazing name-haver Maximilian Galactica, who has been accused of murdering the circus's ringmaster. Naturally, this means Phoenix has to interview people close to the case, which is why you end up talking to Mo, a nightmare clown wearing an outfit covered in pictures of his own mouth. Honestly, clowns, you are not helping yourself at this point. Mo isn't a very successful clown, but that's just because he's terrifying and all his jokes are terrible. Still, I do feel a bit sorry for him after Phoenix's assistant Maya hits him with a he he the second most devastating text response to a joke it's possible to receive. Right behind he, if you were wondering. Anyway, one of the key pieces of evidence in the case is a stone bust of Max Galactica, and it isn't long before the comedy double act of Mo and Phoenix Wright have steered this whole conversation into decidedly PG-13 territory. Phoenix, keep your mind on the case, please! A man is on trial for murder! Anyway, pretty sure I was wholly oblivious to the booby overtones of this whole exchange the first time I played it, and that I probably ascribed it to just Phoenix Wright being weird, which, to be fair, happens a lot. Here I am, for example, interrogating a ventriloquist's dummy. Try as I might, I couldn't get him to talk because my lips kept moving. Get ready, fighters! Go for it, man! You all know Ken Masters from Street Fighter. He's the Ryu palette swap in a blonde wig. Come at me, Ken Mains. Ken's story throughout the Street Fighter series is pretty romantic, considering this is a game about beating people up. Fire. Take the ending of Street Fighter 2 when Ken is finally reunited with his beloved Eliza. Wow, they really spent a whole three minutes on that Eliza character art, huh? And I bet half of that was colouring in. Ken and Eliza's relationship is maintained over the course of the Street Fighter series. So they get married at the end of Street Fighter 2 and have their first child at the end of Super Street Fighter 4, with Ken showing up to the birth in his full street fighting gear. He's so small. Congratulations, Mom. What was he preparing for? Was there a chance the baby might come out doing a hurricane kick? The Street Fighter Alpha prequel series established the origins of that relationship, and in Street Fighter Alpha 3, there was a cheeky joke in Ken's win quotes. After beating his opponent with apparent ease, Ken says he needs a better workout and asks where Eliza is. This is supposedly in reference to them uh, having energetic relations with each other. I am shocked. And also quite relieved that they're not beating each other up. However, we reckon it's still possible people might be reading too much into this line. It could be totally innocent. There's lots of ways Ken and Eliza could be working out together that aren't sexy times. What? They could be doing couples yoga. You lot just have filthy minds. Oh no. Our nefarious old foe, that plundering Punchinello, the Joker. Once again, the dynamic duo spring into action to protect the good and true citizens of Gotham. Brace yourself, boy wonder. Those are military-grade poles, not for fun or recreation. To the Batmobile, Robin, we need to put a stop to that grinning devil. There have been many great interpretations of the character Batman, from Christian Bale's gruff intensity to Michael Keaton's swivel-eyed energy to Ben Affleck's chin was pretty good, so he's got that going for him. That said, many Bat aficionados hold a special place in their heart for the Batman portrayed by Adam West in the 1960s TV series. 
This was a Batman who wore grey spandex and was significantly less ripped than Bale. Also, West delivered every line like he was seconds away from cracking up and admitting the whole thing was a prank and that there are cameras filming you right now. Quick! Everyone! Flee for your lives! Still not entirely sure that isn't the case, to be honest. So when the grown-up developers at Studio Traveller's Tales were developing the third LEGO Batman title in 2014, it made sense for them to include the venerable Mr. Adam West, who was still going strong as a voice actor and fast approaching national treasure status thanks to an adorable and self-aware social media presence. God, that pot roast looks amazing. With this in mind, the developers added Adam West as the character in peril for players to rescue in various levels. Excellent rescuing work back there. One day you might even become as great a legend as me, Adam West. This was the role fulfilled by fellow comic book legend Stan Lee in the Lego Marvel Super Heroes games. I have no idea how that happened. Thanks, true believers. Which is great, but then you remember all the children who enjoy the Lego games and that the Adam West Batman series finished its run in 1968, nearly 50 years before the release of Lego Batman 3. You have to think that as a result, in the future there's going to be a whole generation of kids making videos like this about how they had no idea why this Lego Batman game made them rescue the guy who plays the mayor on Family Guy. Still, maybe it'll encourage that generation to seek out the 1960s Batman TV show to see what Batman used to be like before he became a grumpy, crossfit-obsessed murderer. You can definitely see where they got the idea for the combat system in the Arkham games. Good thinking. Robin. There we go, those were some of the jokes that sailed right over our heads when we were younger and then later in life we went, oh yeah, it was quite rude, wasn't it? I realise now, everything was rude. Anyway, thanks for watching this video and if you want to watch more videos from us up here, we've got one uh, bit of an older video. This is about gimmicks that were too beautiful for this world. They were too far ahead of their time, haven't seen their likes since. And down here is a video from Outside Extra in which we talk about the horrible decisions we made in video games and how much we regret them. So, sounds like fun, doesn't it? Click on that!